I'll, I'll give you a big example. So uh, uh, I tweeted once, uh, I'm your typical um, liberal, lefty, snowflake, champagne, socialist, uh, anti-racist, uh, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic sort of guy. But if I tweet about freedom of speech, I'm suddenly alt-right. Mm. It, it's a nonsense that, to believe that some people deserve never to be offended their whole life. The great thing about freedom of speech, if an arsehole is being an arsehole, you've got the right to call him an arsehole. Like the man arrested in Oxford for calling a police horse gay. <laughs> or the teenager arrested for calling the Church of Scientology a cult. Or the cafe owner arrested for displaying passages from the Bible on a TV screen. One of the movies that you've been in that I absolutely love, we mm. talked about it a second ago, uh, was V for Vendetta. Yeah. And interestingly, in V for Vendetta, um, the, it was the author, authoritarian right that was coming after everyone's rights and everyone's speech. And there's an amazing scene with you and you have this Quran that you're talking about. And yeah. you say you love the imagery of it and all of this. But it's the right that's coming after it. And I find in America right now, it's the left, what, what people are referring to as the regressive left, mm. that seems to be coming after language and speech. Do you, do you see that? Does that? Is that happening across the pond too? I suspect it um, is. We, we fear that it's going to happen more and more because America leads and, and Britain follows in all kinds of ways. And I think it started to happen in Britain with the removal of, or the attempted removal of statues of people who are considered unlikable. Um, uh, that were once very beloved. Once That's beloved suddenly, yeah. and have become in a very 1984 way unpersons. Uh, and suddenly somebody, because they were an imperialist, Cecil Rhodes is the example I'm thinking of, who is, a, uh, who is probably best known in America because of the Rhodes scholarships that Americans take to get sure. to Oxford. Uh, and he founded the country called Rhodesia, hence its, hence, hence its name, uh, which is now Zimbabwe, of course. And he was the founder of De Beers and various diamond things. And he was a, he was a real empire builder. And he was, I'm sure, a monster. He once said to have been born British was to have drawn <laughs> first prize in the lottery of life. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, this is a guy but, who yeah, he has he has, ego thing. There's a big statue of him or a sculpture of him or something in, in, in his Oxford College. And there was a movement to, because people were offended by this because he stood for, you know, he stood for values that we now regard rightly, I think, as, as, as terrible, you know, stealing other people's countries. Right. Not particularly. Not, not a great Not idea. a good thing to do and, yeah. and, and raiding all their, their mineral wealth. Yeah. Um, but to, to remove his statue, um, it strikes me as being stupid. I mean, the, the, the way to fight colonialism and the ideas behind it is not to, is not to pull down statues. Yeah. It is, it is to actually to reveal, to say who he is. This is who this man was. Look at him. Yeah. Um, so he this might is, occasionally throw an egg at it. Yeah, and this is like when in America we now don't, they won't show repeats of the show Dukes of Hazard because yeah. they had a Confederate flag on it. Or I'll even hear, you know, Thomas Jefferson, people say, well, you know, it's known that he was sleeping with one of his slaves. And people say, well, he was a rapist and we should That's now. He but he also, he also octoroon. helped free the slaves. Yeah, you know? I know. It's because life is complicated. It is indicative of a culture that has taken hold of the programs of successive governments that with the reasonable and well-intentioned ambition to contain obnoxious elements in society has created a society of an extraordinarily authoritarian and controlling nature. It is what you might call the new intolerance a new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent. I am not intolerant, say many people, say many softly spoken, highly educated, liberal-minded people. I'm only intolerant of intolerance. <laughs> and people tend to nod sagely and say, oh yes, wise words, wise words. And yet if you think about this supposedly inarguable statement for longer than five seconds, you realize that all it is advocating is the replacement of one kind of intolerance with another. The best way to increase society's resistance to insulting or offensive speech is to allow a lot more of it. As with childhood diseases, you can better resist those germs to which you have been exposed. We need to build our immunity to taking offence so that we can deal with the issues that perfectly justified criticism can raise. Our priority should be to deal with the message not the messenger. As President Obama said in an address to the United Nations only a month or so ago, laudable efforts to restrict speech 
can become a tool to silence critics or oppress minorities. The strongest weapon against hateful speech is not repression, it is more speech. <laughs>